Martin is here to present Future, Futures Literacy, developed by UNESCO, a tool that aims to bridge present and future in a meaningful way through capability building. UNESCO, coming from heritage, is now in the business of imagining a future heritage. So please give Martin a warm welcome. Wow. Thank you very much for those questions. They were perfect. I think, I think you need to listen to her, not to me. In fact, there have been way too many white, white men on the stage, I think, so we probably should. You probably should just come and speak in my place. I think you've got it. Um, I'm also super jealous because I only have one badge. I noticed you had two badges. I, 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 I don't know what that means, but there's obviously something there. Yes, Mina. <laughs> um, we're going to walk a little bit higher. We're going to take a little bit of altitude We're on, uh, uh, on a little bit of perspective on enterprise design. First of all, I'm super proud to be here because when uh, speaking with Milan and when I uh, read the ambition that you have as a, as a gathering, uh, it's a real honor to be here. You guys have an amazing responsibility. You have taken on an incredible responsibility. We've been talking a lot about implementation, and we've been talking about how to get things done and impact, and you clearly have that. Now, maybe the question that you need to ask yourself is, what, whose agenda am I implementing? What is the underlying power structure that I am supporting? What future, whose future am I actually putting into practice? And is that a future that I want to be a part of? And is that as open a future as might be? Or rather, am I what we in the futures thinking world call, is that a used future? Am I merely colonizing the past? Am I merely projecting rather than imagining? Am I merely projecting into the future? Like the question you asked a minute ago, uh, actually, you asked a minute ago, am I just using the raw data that I know, whether it is through an AI model, whether it is through my own experience, and passing that forward? Oh, it was working, wasn't it, a second ago? There we go. Try again. All right, so what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is that contrary to what we may think, because we live in a world which I think everybody would agree with, the pace of change is accelerating, we're constantly inventing new things, products, services, uh, but in reality, unfortunately, I think we live in a world where we suffer from a collective poverty of imagination. We too often confuse special effects imagine it, with imagination or with innovation and change. We too often confuse the latest fad with actually something new and with novelty. And what I would like to suggest is this, in fact, has as its root cause a very limited way that we have of using the future. When was the last time you used the future? Probably a couple of seconds ago, when you decided whether you were going to stay for my presentation or go to have early drinks, right? This morning, when you got dressed, Obviously, in work situations. What is that? What are you using the future for? Yeah. Yeah, a thought process. I, I wish that were true. Isn't it more just a plan what you're going to do? How you're going to get dressed? Isn't it more? how you're going to achieve the enterprise design that you've just come up with? 
Isn't it more to optimize what it is you've planned? Or just risk. I saw risk in a lot of the presentations this morning. To manage risk. Our basic, when, when you study futures, and when you study future, futures thinking, the reality is that our anticipatory systems, because all we're talking about here is anticipatory systems, every living creature that we know today has some kind of anticipatory system built in. It's very deep, it's very... We all have that in order to deal with risk, danger, contingency. So, the reality is that unfortunately today, our uses of the future are extremely limited to two main scenarios, planning, and contingency, planning for contingency and optimization for realization of what a given plan, okay? So, this is what happens. We live in a box. We stay in that box. We optimize the box. We get better and better at having that fishbowl look good, brighter colors, or less bright colors, whatever it is that you like. More gadgets. But, the actual innovation, the actual change, actually thinking outside of the box, actually jumping outside of that fishbowl. We do not use the future. We do not have, literally, we do not have today the capability, and what I'm going to be talking to you about today is the capability of doing that. Because it's not just a tool. We have lots of creativity tools. You know them probably better than I do. I would contend that by and large, when you apply those creativity tools, you're actually not pushing the boundaries of novelty. You're actually not imagining much that is new. Let's get into that a little bit. So, maybe before we get into that, another question. How does thinking about the future expand our imagination? When we imagine, there's a, fact, a central fact about thinking about the future. Thinking about the future only functions on assumptions. You can only think about the future through assumptions. Why? Because the future doesn't exist. Have any of you been there? I've just got back from Dubai, the museum of the future. It was not the future. I'm going to be traveling to Brazil soon, to the Museum of Tomorrow. I have sneaking suspicion that I'm not going to be seeing tomorrow. Not because what they show is wrong, but simply because what they show is a version of the future, among countless other possible versions of the future. And our way of thinking especially you as enterprise designers, and I would say that this is your responsibility, once again, is to implement a preconceived plan, therefore a preconceived vision of the future. So what really we're going to be trying to do and exploring together today is how do I expand that? How can I increase my perception? Because as soon as you have a plan, that's what's so comfortable about plans. Is that you can eliminate everything that doesn't fit into the plan. Right? Super. Okay, don't have to deal with that. I've simplified my problem, I can move forward. In a world of complexity, I would suggest that, that before you move, make that decision, think again. The second one is that it impacts what, what we see as possible the choices we have in front of us. The way we use the future, the assumptions we make, define the menu of choices we have today. So once again, I would contend that the limited uses of the future that we have not only limit our perception, but they limit our choice. And once again, if there's one thing that you as enterprise designers need is greatest possible perception, of what is out there, the weak signals, 
What am I not seeing? Whose voice am I not hearing? And then, of course, translate that into choice. And choices. Then choices need to be made. When, as soon as one gets into action mode, one needs to make choices. But at least you've made those choices consciously, I hope. So, like I said, all futures are based on assumptions. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about assumptions. I'll give you three basic assumptions. It's going to rain tomorrow. We've all made this assumption a million times. What is it based on? Yeah, and the forecast is based on? Data. It's a typical data-based, data-driven model. Nothing wrong with that, but you need to understand what, it's, what you've built it on, right? Technology will save us from climate change. Another good assumption, which is probably shared by a number of us in this room today. What is that based on? Belief, Belief to a certain extent? A system? Yeah? The past? The recent past, I would say. But yes, absolutely. And maybe a degree of hope. Or maybe uh, a bit of fear that if it's not technology that's going to save us, what the, excuse me, will? Right? S two assumptions that come from two different, very different places. I'm not sure that unless you actually stop and think about it, I'm not sure how many of us distinguish what those two assumptions are built on. So that's really what futures literacy is about. And realizing, therefore, that what's happening when we anticipate is that we actually have a black box, an anticipatory black box. Because we don't question these assumptions, do we? Or rarely. Because we just make these assumptions, whether based on experience, whether based on habit, whether they're baked into the models. The data that we suck up for our learning models. The social structure, the system itself. Remember, uh, I don't remember who said this, so don't quote me, but every system is built to perform that which it performs. So, it's usually, the problem is usually not with the system. The system does even if the actual underlying, what we're actually think it, think, we think it would like it to do, is not what it does. So what happens is that we have a very bound, our images of the future are actually very limited. And we are designing for the future. Once again, I would contend that, that is, this is what you're doing today. You are designing for the future. Nothing wrong with that, but it's a closed system. Unless, or rather, why? Maybe, uh, if we, I think we have enough time. Let me get into this for a second. Why do we have this black box? Two main reasons. Cognitive tendencies. This is the way our brain works. Our heuristics. We are very powerful. In fact, we're probably the most powerful anticipatory machines out there. We love repeatability. We were talking about it this morning. It's, we feel it's really safe. Remember how our brain developed. Our brain developed as a survival tool. And it's a very good tool. But what does that mean? It means that it is built to filter out what is dangerous and what is not. And it hates to think. Because thinking takes up energy. As biological creatures, we are built to save energy. So? What are we going to do? You know, fast thinking, slow thinking, all that business? I'm not going to get into all the details, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Right? By default, the way our brain works is to eliminate anything that it feels is not a threat to it. All right? Which means it's going to go back to habit, it's going to go back to what it knows. And the issue here is not so much that that's good or bad, 
In fact, it's fantastic. We'd have total mental overload if that weren't the case. The point is that we are not aware of what the brain eliminates. So anything that's emergent, anything that we don't know, and I, once again, I would suggest that today we live in a time when it is absolutely desperately necessary that we actually pay attention to that which we don't know. So, this is one of the issues that we're dealing with, one of the reasons why we have a black box, one of the reasons why anticipation and imagination are as limited as they are. I'll talk about, I, I won't talk about each one. The other big thing here is what we learn and how we learn and our culture. Let me just use one example here. We can talk about values, we can talk about culture, we can talk about models as much as we want. Uh, I'd just like to talk about science fiction for a second. Black Panther or Avatar, thick Avatar. Same old story. of the colonization of the United States, or any other country for that matter. But the, the flashbacks of the US are pretty strong. Except that now it's the Indians who win, right? Not quite. It's the Indians who win, but why? Because a cowboy becomes an Indian. Why am I saying this? Is because in a globalized world, more and more, these very powerful images of what the future is and what the future can be are being bombarded on us. And what, I'm, what, I, what scares me is that these images are not new. We are recycling the same old images over and over again, but we're making them look really cool. We ran a lab in Kenya not long ago, and the image that came out of Kenya, the future that the Iranian Kenyans wanted, was Black Panther. Now, sure, it empowers them, but they're just reproducing our model of the superhero. No, it's not Superman, the same difference. What happens to all the local knowledge? What happens to the indigenous knowledge? What happens to the local tradition and culture? No judgment, but awareness. So, futures literacy here is all about imagining different kinds of futures. First of all, just the very notion of realizing that, you have, that there are different kinds of futures is super important. Not just one. And that my future could be your nightmare, by the way. Secondly, it is because I see these different kinds of futures that, luckily enough, I can actually act in the present. Because it's this ability to see the futures that gives me Agency. And if there's something that's been the central theme in everything I've heard today, is agency. Your agency and your ability to provide agency in the organizations or in the enterprises that you are supporting. Just try to make that agency as big as possible. How does that work? We need to understand our underlying assumptions. We always have, when you talk about the future, you always have here, what we see, the visible part. That's the easy part. And even there, there's work to be done. What you really need to understand is, like I said before, what are the systems in place and what are the underlying stories? Whose future are you promoting? You are inevitably promoting a future. There's no doubt about that. It is someone's future. Is it the current power structure? Is it a new power structure? Is it the obvious message? Apple telling us, we're doing a pretty good job, actually. Sustainability. The question you ask, what is sustainability? What is a sustainable enterprise? Well, this is fundamental to ask these questions. What is the system? What are the values underlying it? If the values are the same upon which we have built our economic system today, 
Think about it for a second. We have a magical economic system today that is dominant in the West, based on scarcity. And it works like magic. The less of one thing there is, the more the value goes up, and poof, equilibrium. Price, supply, demand. Which, in other words, means anything that has a price has value, right? Anything that doesn't have a price doesn't have value. Sustainability today has no price. Therefore, it has no value. So thinking about sustainability until you've addressed or at least identified some of these issues Um, I think I'm running out of time, so uh, just be aware of the fact that this is a theory based also on practice. This is a capability. So futures literacy is learning how to think and challenge these things and understanding how deeply we are influenced by what we measure, how we measure it, what we consider valuable, the assumptions that, go, that underlie all of this. In order to explore this, There's a four-phase laboratory that we call the Futures Literacy Lab. I'll be, I'll be happy to talk to you about it uh, at the break. Uh, the good thing about it is, that it is that it's both fun and effective. And the idea here, and then I'm almost done, is that this I told you about, this is what we do. What I'd love for us to be able to do is to have emergence, is to Use the futures for emergence. And what I would like to finish on is maybe a call for you all. And I will quote Simone de Beauvoir, who is, for those of you who know, one of the founding figures of feminism, because I think enterprise design needs to be an activist movement. That is your, I believe that is your calling. But let us beware, lest our lack of imagination impoverish our future. And I would like to invite you all to keep that in mind and to con constantly ask yourself, whose power story am I telling when I implement any given enterprise? Don't just be the implementers, be the architects even more so, be the visionaries, be the thinkers, be the challengers behind those visions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin. We do have time for a few questions, if you have any. <clears throat> uh, does your method have anything to do with the vision in product design methods? Have you heard of this? Yes. Um, I would say it's, it's quote-unquote bigger than that, in the sense that then when you get into the lab phase, the actual different methodologies, because it's all about collective intelligence uh, and exploring, you, you can use that as well. Uh, but it, it, it encompasses it, so to speak. All right? Um, you just finished with the sentence, uh, collective intelligence. Yeah. In my opinion, uh, and you talked about thinking outside the box somewhere. Yeah. Isn't it a fact actually that we should learn to think inside of, inside of the box constantly and not outside of the box? Because I don't think we understand each other inside the box. <laughs> and this is also where you have the, the collective uh, intelligence coming together. Do you agree on that? Well, first of, all, first of all, I love the contrarian thinking, so great. Uh, disagree. Uh, or do, so, two things. Um, first of all, to really think outside the box is really, and to really think and see things that we don't see before because our filter doesn't allow us to see it, only works through collective intelligence. It is only work through the intelligence of the group, through the different perspectives of the group, that you can actually start seeing things that were blind, you were blind to before. So that's the first bit of, bit, bit of answer. The second bit of answer is that I do believe that you do need to step outside of the box to see what the limits are 
in order to then come back into the box and change something inside it. Otherwise, you are once again always only playing with what you know. And I think if today we are in the situation we are today, is that that is exactly what we've been doing. And unless you step outside of the box to see what am, what am I not seeing? What am I not seeing because of the filters that I've put on? How do you... I didn't answer your question, I guess. I would contend that we're not that good at thinking outside the box, but that's the discussion we need to have to see whether, you know, I'd, I'd love to be proven wrong. Uh, yeah. Any other thoughts? Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my question is more about how do you help people push that boundary? and get them there. Because what I often deal with, because I facilitate a lot of the ideation sessions, is people cannot get past their, it's very hard for them to get past their current pain, mm. right? And until they do somehow, they can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. Because it hurts too much. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're actually doing some interesting work, uh, the relationship between trauma and pain, and futures, rather which is actually a whole other super interesting question. But uh, future, the futures are a very powerful thing. When we talk about futures, we open up. It's something which makes us vulnerable, whether we like it or not. So there is the, the process of going through the lab, of thinking about very, very briefly, what is probable? What is desirable? Then how do I, from that, move into something that is truly outside the box, um, that is actually a very powerful journey uh, that uh, allows people often to move beyond, I wouldn't be, I, I don't know if I could say the trauma, that maybe is a bit much, or the pain, uh, but definitely to actually move into the future. One of the other things that's really interesting is that it, because it's a collective exercise, there's, it, there's an enormous amount of hope when you hear all the different futures in the room. It opens, it's not just you having to make the effort of saying, how do I step out of my pain? You see everybody else step out of the future or into new futures. And in that respect, it can be, it can be quite powerful. Um, it's true, we've done it, this, this has been done with migrants in Greece recently. They have a concept of the future which is considerably influenced, I would say, by what they're living. And, but even there, you see the, the power of it. Uh, because they too are driven by a future. They too are driven by an assumption, or by assumptions. And um, despite the tragic conditions in which they're in, they can think differently, they can explore different futures. That's powerful. And so is this narrative. And Martin, we really, really thank you for sharing this. Thank you. Thank you.